All right, so I just want to do this with you guys uh, briefly this morning because um, I have a, a question that was posted to me um, on YouTube, and it was a it was a, a no star that this guy is having a problem with, and it's an older Mazda. It's a six two six, and it has no spark, and uh, the poor guy's gone through all kind of different garages and parts and components and in any case right now um, it is a no spark condition so um, not only is this going to help this guy obviously but I think it would be good for us to go over some basic ignition stuff uh, that I don't normally cover in this class this would more be your basic electrical class but um, I think I'm going to use the opportunity to do this with you guys too um, and so <clears throat> just looking at the um, computer diagram real quick, um, it's a very basic system. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I mentioned to you guys when attempting a diagnosis on an unfamiliar system, this was section one in my book, it's like first page or two. I said, do your homework, do your research, you know, go on Mitchell, go on all data, whatever you program you might use, use a internet sites, IATN, great uh, information database, um, and spend some time reading about the system that you're working on. So I did that. Um, just to save time, this is all we got in Mitchell. This is the car. This is this 626. And it says electronic ignition, uh, except Miata and, and a Navajo. And that's what we're dealing with. This one's a 626 basic design. It says Mitsubishi breakerless electronic ignition consists of an igniter, ignition coil, pickup coil, and distributor. Um, the control module is mounted inside the distributor with a pickup coil assembly. Okay, so some decent info. Um, let's go look back real quick. Look at the wiring diagram. And this diagram is, is pretty much horrible from a standpoint of, of information. I mean, it has, let me blow this up a little bit. If you look at the diagram, we have an ignition coil right here, and we have a distributor. And if uh, I'll go through the rest of this in a minute, but nowhere in this picture are they showing the igniter or the module and how it functions. So it's it's probably one of the worst diagrams that you could deal with when dealing with an ignition system as far as operation. How do I test this thing? So I did find some info though, and that's this. And it says uh, when the ignition is on, ignition coil primary circuits energized as distributor shaft rotates, reluctor rotates inside the stator. Uh, this is going on to talk about basically how a pickup coil works. And then at that point, a signal is sent to the igniter. So the igniter breaks the primary circuit in the coil, causing high voltage surge in the coil secondary uh, circuit required to fire the spark plugs. And then as far as timing advance goes, on this car, centrifugal and vacuum advanced units. So this is a non-computer controlled ignition system is what that means, centrifugal and vacuum advance. Uh, the Miata MX-6 Turbo, 626 Turbo, and my, ours is a non-turbo that we're dealing with. So the non-turbo 626 is uh, centrifugal and vacuum, which means um, to someone doing a no-start, no-spark diagnosis, the computer is not involved at all. Okay? Um, so what I want to do first, before we run through this car, is I want to give you an idea of this centrifugal and vacuum advance stuff on ignition and also uh, the pickup coil, um, a pickup coil and, and a distributor and an igniter and how these are used on older designs. This might actually maybe help you with your RX-7 yeah. potentially. All right, uh, and this is a Mazda system, so I would imagine, what year is your RX-7? 83. Yeah, so this is going to be, this will be helpful for you too. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to use an old school GM four-pin ignition module. And, and this came out, uh, this was the replacement for points and condensers. Um, and and a, point, a point and condenser type system, just to talk about that very briefly, what you had was an ignition feed coil, and then you had a set of contacts, just a set of points that would ride inside the distributor. Um, and I, we won't talk about the 
Well, yeah, we can. They would add a, a ballast resistor, ballast resistor in here too on the feed side that would limit current flow. I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, coil primary was controlled by a mechanical set of points that would open and close. Uh, I'm not an artist, so I can't really draw the cam and the way the distributor is designed. But uh, what you what you had basically was was a a piece uh, that would ride near this, or you'd have like a rubbing block, and as the distributor would rotate, each of these points would open and close, you know, the points on the distributor, which would control coil primary. When the points were closed, we would have current flow through this circuit when the points were closed. When the points were open, uh, current flow would stop. So points closed, we make a magnetic field around this coil. Points closed, we make a magnetic field around the primary. And as soon as the points open, that field would collapse, and that's where we got our spark. And that was because we had a secondary winding that would have been wrapped around this thing, and this would be your coil. That's where your spark's coming from. Okay? Um, how do we make 12 volts into 40,000 volts? That's really what we're doing. We're taking 12 volts, and we're making 40,000 volts. 12 volts being your source... 40,000 volts coming out of here, and it had to do with magnetic fields and mutual induction, self-induction. Primary winding, when the primary magnetic field would collapse, you'd get somewhere around a 400 volt spike in this primary, it would spike up. Why do we get 40,000 in the secondary? Because there's a thousand times the number of windings, and it's a simple math formula. It's times a thousand. That's where you are top, sorry, 100 times the number of windings, times 100, what do you get? 40,000 volts. More conductors, more voltage. Stronger magnet, more voltage. Faster motion, more voltage. It was a magnetism law. That's where 40,000 is coming from. So anyway, mechanically, we were opening and closing these points. How was timing controlled on this design? It was done by moving either the points would actually, uh, they were on a hinged piece that the points would actually rotate just a little bit this way or this way. And this, uh, this block in the middle would also uh, advance or retard based on centrifugal force. So it was actually the lineup of where the points would open and close would be your ignition timing. It was done with centrifugal weights and it was done with a vacuum advance. Um, after this design, they replaced the points, and they went with, with this guy. This was GM's design. A four-pin ignition, four ignition module. And what's missing now in this distributor is that there was no longer points. And from what I was told when I was in school, is this was a very scary moment for the guys that were in the field. You know, this is one of the first transistors that they were exposed to, this four-pin magic module uh, that controlled ignition timing. Uh, but this is what it did. This is just the basics of how this works. Um, over here is your coil primary. So your primary is controlled by a transistor, which is inside of here little transistor uh, review we did the other day, which is emitter base collector, and we'll just pick on an NPN type transistor, which this one is. And for us to have flow through, this is emitter, this is collector, this is the base. For us to have flow through this transistor, you needed to have a small voltage on the base for that to happen, right? It takes small current, down here to control a large current over here. So if you look at this picture right here, we have the same thing going on. That the base, which is right here, is the base, we need some kind of a turn on off signal, which is going to allow coil primary current to travel through the transistor to ground, which gives the coil its 
magnetic field, right? When the transistor's on, the ignition coil is energized, makes a magnetic field. When the transistor's turned off, we'll collapse that magnetic field, and that's where our spark comes from. Okay? Question so far? What's that? Okay, um, I'll try to address this question. It was, you know, where's where's the spark coming from? Um, I'm not showing the secondary winding in here. I'm only showing the primary, so there you're not going to have spark. Um, it wouldn't matter if this is a waste spark coil, a coil over plug system, or a conventional coil. They all have to have a primary that turns on and turns off. There would be a secondary winding that would be uh, that would be wound around this. That this is where your spark's going to come from is, is this guy right here. This would be this would be your coil, what they call a coil tower. It comes from there, and that spark's not going to come out of there when this transistor is turned on, and we have current flow through our primary winding to ground. That's not when our spark occurs. That's when we're charging the coil. We're making a magnetic field. Our spark occurs <coughs> when this current flow, you saw it just disappear, that's where spark would occur. As soon as we shut it off is where spark occurs. And it was the same thing on the point type system. As soon as the points opened was where spark occurred. Points closed would be the amount of time that the current is traveling through the primary was called your dwell time. Uh, point dwell was the amount of time the points were closed in degrees. Um, ignition timing was simply when the points open. That's where spark occurs. Okay, step up transformer is what an ignition coil is. And we're stepping it up by 100 times because there's 100 times the number of conductors. Does that make sense? So that's where our spark's coming from. It's a step up transformer effect. But you need a magnetic field. You gotta understand that that these two these two guys are surrounded by the same magnetic field. That primary winding makes a magnetic field around both windings. Right? And when the primary collapses, you you get that really fast, strong magnetic field moving across the conductor, what are you gonna make? You make voltage. It, it just happens. And you'll get a 400 volt spike in the primary times 100 for the secondary because there's 100 times the number of conductors, so you make 100 times the amount of voltage, and there's your spark. Right? Um, I, I mentioned the ballast too earlier, but that was all in just keeping the primary winding from burning up. If you, if you think about, let me jump back for a second, um, slow speeds on a point type can, uh, system. Slow speeds, meaning idle speeds, wouldn't the points be closed longer in time because the distributor's rotating more slowly at lower speeds? And the issue with a point type system is you burn up the ignition coil at idle and low speeds because the primary winding will make a magnetic field, but then the magnetic field can only get so strong, it's called coil saturation. And once you reach that point, if you continue to have current flow through that winding, you're just making heat. You're not adding to the, you know, discharge of the coil. You're just making heat. So they added a ballast on the feed line, which would heat up. It was a PTC resistor, positive temperature coefficient. As temperature would rise, the resistance would rise, which would reduce the current flow to that coil keep the coil from burning up. It's all done electronically now. We don't have to worry about that. In fact, you can see that in this picture. That's what this little generic little resistor is right there. It's a current limiting device. That eliminated the ballast. There was no ballast resistor once they went to electronic. Uh, but we're getting a little bit off track. I don't really want to talk about uh, that too much. I just want to focus on, on this guy. <clears throat> this guy replaced... <clears throat> the points. What is a transistor? It is an electronic switch with no moving parts. So what did the points do? They were a switch. It turned on and off the primary circuit. What is the main component that took that place was this transistor right here. <clears throat> All 
All right. Now here's the thing. Transistors can't work by themselves. We can't have flow through the load side of the transistor, the collector <laughs> emitter, without base circuit control. And in our case, what we want to do is send a small on-off square wave on the base to switch it on and switch it off. Right? When the voltage is high on the base, transistor's on. When the voltage is low or uh, near zero on the base, transistor's off. So there's our on-off control. Now where's that coming from? It's coming from, you'll have a square wave actually internal on this. There will be a small base circuit turn on-off control signal right there. Where is it coming from? It's coming from this signal converter, also known as an AD converter, analog to digital converter. But it's coming from a pickup coil. And a pickup coil, that's this guy up here, this pickup coil just simply makes an AC sine wave. And it, again, it's motion magnet conductor. How are they doing it? Permanent magnet inside the distributor, a conductor inside the distributor. So we have two of the things we need, but now we need motion. We need motion, magnet, and conductor. We have two of the three we need sitting right on top of each other. A big coil wire wrapped around thousands of times, right? That's what's inside of here is just a bunch of copper wire, right? And two leads coming out. But what they do is they'll put a magnet <coughs> over top of that. So now we have two of, the, two of the things we need, but the next thing we need is motion. You got to move the magnetic field to make voltage. So that motion is actually going to be timed with that particular engine. If it's a if it's a four cylinder, if it's a six cylinder, if it's an eight cylinder, you're going to have different pole pieces inside of there that these little reluctor teeth that we're looking at right here, those teeth inside uh, are going to be the number of teeth on there are going to match the cylinders on the car. And what happens with this is as those teeth move, um, there's a breakdown I actually have of this in um, section 21, ignition system inputs under VRS testing. That's variable reluctance sensor. That's the kind of sensor this is. As the, the tooth approaches alignment, you get an increase in voltage. As the tooth aligns, it drops. And as the tooth moves away, you get a negative voltage, and this would basically be this reluctor and pickup coil lining up, okay? This is tooth approaching. This is tooth moving away. And right here at this center point would be the tooth is aligned, all right? Now, there's a lot of characteristics that go into the AC sine wave, but the point is as the distributor rotates, you're going to get one sine wave like that, Near top dead center, I say near because not all distributors are timed at zero degrees. You know, exactly top dead center. Let's say hypothetically that the teeth align right here at 10 degrees before top dead center. Mechanically, this is done mechanically. Can you guys visualize that? Distributor is mechanically timed to the camshaft. And then the camshaft turns, it turns the distributor, and the teeth are mechanically aligned at top dead center, those little pole piece, reluctor, pickup coil teeth, okay? Does that indicate which cylinder or just a cylinder? On an older distributor engine, did it really matter what cylinder is what to this ignition system? It didn't. It only mattered that a cylinder was at top dead center, okay? So there was no cam crank signals and sync signals. It was just simply every time a cylinder approached top dead center, you would get a sine wave like that. And that sine wave is actually being fed into this signal converter. What did the signal converter do to that? A transistor needs distinct on-off signals to function. Is this AC sine wave over here a distinct on-off signal. It's not. It's variable, right? So what this AD converter did was it took this signal basically and conditioned it and here's what it did with it. Here's the converted signal of this sine wave. 
I said just draw it out. It is now a square wave. Actually, if you think about it, you know, you're taking off, you're kind of taking off the bottom half of this, you're cutting it off, right? And then you're taking this, this up here and you're just conditioning it and you're making a square wave out of it. So you're just using that top portion of that AC sine wave and you're making a square wave out of it. Now, uh, we can definitely control a transistor with this now, that small little signal. That's what's coming out of here. This is where we're looking right here. We got a sine wave coming in here, and we got square waves coming out of here. When should the spark occur? Again, when the pickup coil teeth align is near top dead center, base timing. We're talking about base time. You set your base time. When those pickup coil teeth align, so we're talking about these guys here. Here, let me get rid of this crap. I'm talking about, whoops. I'm talking about these teeth right here, right? This was stationary. These outer teeth, stationary. These inner ones, these are rotating with the distributor turn. So when the teeth align is where we should have spark. Now I'll put the square wave in there. When does the spark occur? If you're looking at this square wave right here, where does the spark, where is the spark going to occur? When the transistors turn on or when the transistors turn off? Off. So no coincidence that the trailing edge of this square wave right here was exactly lined up with that midpoint, that zero point where the teeth align. This is where spark would occur. Right there is where your spark would occur. Questions so far? I'm building on something. I want to. I want to show you how spark advances and retards. Next, but you need to understand that part first. <clears throat> what do we need right here on my little green arrow? What do we need? Uh, what do we need here? I need a signal. Where's that signal coming from? What's generating that square wave? Yes, it's coming from the signal converter, but where is that coming from? Yeah, the pickup coil. I mean, it's coming from this guy right here. And what makes that signal? It is a motion magnet conductor, it's electromagnetic induction. It's, it's creating its own voltage. Right? The distributor is turning, and we're inducing voltage, we're creating an AC sine wave, and we're using that to trigger this transistor. Okay? So, notice in the picture that they're showing centrifugal and vacuum advance mechanisms. And if you can picture this for a second, if this distributor is rotating this way, so the armature inside or the reluctor inside is rotating in a clockwise direction, if we pull vacuum on this chamber right here, and that pulls this lever in this direction, what that's going to do is it's going to pull this whole pull piece this way just a little bit. So if you got... If you got the inside one rotating this way and the outside one going that way, aren't they the teeth going to align up in a different location now as far as crankshaft position goes? Isn't the teeth, aren't the teeth going to line up sooner when we put vacuum on that vacuum advance mechanism? The teeth line up sooner mechanically to the engine. The teeth, the reluctor inside, the pole piece outside, the pickup coil outside, they line up sooner. So if you were looking at a sine wave, so when you set your base timing, you're setting up this guy and how these align. And this point here, let's say this is 10 degrees. Each time these teeth align is 10 degrees before top dead. What's it going to look like when you move the vacuum advance, they're just going to move over, and so the, the altered sine wave it just moves the thing over. And so now instead of being at 10 degrees, now we're at 20 degrees before top dead center. So the actual pickup coil signal shifted 
in relation to the crankshaft sooner. And if the pickup signal changed sooner, what else changed sooner? The square wave coming out is in exact time. This signal right here coming, coming out is the exact time of the sine wave. All right, so I said if we move the sine wave, like I'm showing here, if we move the sine wave over, and what moved the sine wave? And by moving the sine wave, I'm saying moving it in relation to crankshaft position, piston position, we could say, right? If the sine wave occurs sooner, think about where the cylinder's at. It's approaching top dead center. If the sine wave occurs sooner, the spark is going to occur sooner because the square wave occurred sooner and the transistor turned off sooner and our spark occurred sooner. That's ignition timing. It's actually very simple if you think about it like that. So you see where the centrifugal advance came in is it altered timing by about 10 degrees with a uh, vacuum advance. Did I say centrifugal? Yeah. Centrifugal comes into play uh, a little bit differently, and I, I can't show you that, but they're showing in this generic picture some uh, some weights, and they were centrifugal force. We know what centrifugal force is. Um, these were weighted little blocks that had springs on them, and the springs would keep them closed, and you could change your timing curve by changing your springs. Uh, we could delay uh, when they opened up. When they opened, centrifugal force would open them, um, it would actually cause this middle reluctor inside to advance. So if the distributor is turning this way, when the centrifugal weights came into play, they would actually kick this thing forward a little bit more than the rotation of the distributor. So again, the teeth would align sooner, and you got maybe 10, 20, maybe 30 degrees. 20 degrees off your centrifugal weights, mechanically timed, the faster it would spin, the more advanced your timing would be, centrifugal. But it was all done, uh, to wrap this up, it was all done by taking a sine wave and converting it to a digital square wave. What did that? This little magic box in here, where'd that come from? I don't know, aliens made that thing, right? <clears throat> But we take this sine wave, we convert it to a square wave, we use this square wave to control the base circuit of a transistor, and that transistor is what turns a coil on and off. Spark. Does that make sense? So let's, let's talk about what this thing needs to function here. What does, this, what does this set up? This basic old school design ignition system need to function, to be able to turn this coil on and off, and our coil's not shown here, the coil would be sitting out here. What does this module need to work? We need a signal coming in, right? I need a sine wave right here. Where's that sine wave coming from? It comes from the distributor, right? The pickup coil itself. A self-generating uh, signal. It doesn't need any outside source to function. Does that make sense? This pickup coil does not need a power and a ground. It is the power and ground. It makes its own voltage. So what does that need? It just needs motion. So if you had a no spark situation on this car, wouldn't you want to make sure the distributor is still turning? Broken timing belt, for example. Um, you need to have motion in there. It has to be spinning. So that would be one. But we need a sine wave, and then for this signal converter to work on this design, this module, this is a simplified view of it. Notice that they're showing right here a battery source. So, so this ignition control module, this is called, uh, we can call this an ICM, ignition control module. On the car we're about to look at, we can call this an igniter. And there are some differences in spelling on these, as you saw. It was spelled with an O-R, and you look up igniter, you read it in some other ones, it's spelled with an E-R. I'm no English major, O-R, E-R, whatever, igniter, okay? Same thing, but <clears throat> this one, 
talking about an ICM, do we need power on this module for it to do its job? What is its job? Its job is to make a square wave right here, right? And its job is to make that square wave to turn this transistor on and off right here to turn the coil on and off, okay? This module needs a power feed. What else does it need? So we're talking about a no spark situation here. Uh, we need an input. Our input is over here, and that is our pickup coil. We need a power over here. We need a ground. See this ground says GRD. We need a ground. And that ground was on the housing itself. Right? That distributor ground was on the housing itself on this design. How much amperage does this ground have to carry right here? How much amperage does a primary ignition coil draw? Anywhere on average, guys, from 6 to 10 amps of current flow, a primary coil will draw. That doesn't sound like a lot of amperage, but trust me, that's a lot of amperage in the electronic world. So how good of a ground does that need to be? On that uh, old school design, if you remember doing these, some of you might, you actually pulled the module out and you put this... Uh, like a heat sink grease on the back of the module when you bolted it down. That was to dissipate heat. That's how hot these things got. But it had to be a good clean connection, so good ground. So we need a power, we need a ground, we need an input, and then of course you have to have the integrity over here of your ignition coil. But that's it. That's all you had. How easy of it, uh, is it to do a no spark diagnosis on one of these? It actually is very easy. Um, and one of the things that <coughs> that I was taught back in the day when learning about these was, was to do a bypass test. Um, and on this design, this was a P and an N that stood for positive and negative. And what you did, I actually have a video on this. It's BRS bypass testing. It's on YouTube, and I'm showing a 7-pin module, so it's a computer-controlled one. I'm showing a 7-pin where you can do the same thing, but actually there's, there's two things you can do. The one I'm showing is, let's say this, this system came in right here to, you, to your shop, and it wasn't starting, and all you have is a voltmeter and a test line. You didn't have a scope. You know, scan tool, you can throw that out the door. I mean, there was no scanner functions here. There, this is a carbureted engine with a vacuum and centrifugal advance mechanism. Uh, or it might even be fuel injected, and anyway, the ignition system's separate. But what you could do is, well, your options would be, obviously, the coil could be bad. You could have a, a battery power problem. You could have a ground problem. Uh, you could have a, a module problem. You could have a pickup coil problem. But what you could do, this car comes in, take the distributor cap off, go to the P-pin, with a test light to battery positive and touch on and off the P-pin. And what that did was generate a high-low signal to the signal converter, and it would interpret that as the pickup coil signal, and it would turn this transistor on and off. It would make the square wave. And what should happen when you did this bypass test with your test light? What should happen? The coil should fire every time you do it. If the coil fires every time you do that test, what is good in this picture? How's my battery battery feed to the module? It's good. How's my coil? It's good. How's my module itself? It's good. If you had no spark to begin with, where would your focus go? You got a problem with your pickup coil. Does that make sense? Let's say the test didn't work. When you did the test with the test light, then we wouldn't go to the pickup coil. We'd focus on module, power, and the coil itself. So it was a kind of go, no, go test. Does that make sense? It was one that you, you're at a fork in the road, you're turning left or you're turning right. Very, very valuable test. VRS bypass test. Look it up. I have it up there. I think that's the listing for it. VRS, variable reluctance sensor. That's what this pickup coil is. Makes its own voltage. VRS bypass test. All right, so I, I had to do that to fill you guys in on this car. So let's let's look at the design and, and let's plug in some some knowledge here that maybe we gained. I don't know if you'll be able to or not, but try to hang with me here. All right, let's take a look at the coil itself first. 
And one of the things that I wanted to do when I looked at this car for this guy is how is this coil triggered? In other words, what is the component responsible for turning the coil on and off? It's kind of tough to see on this, but this is actually on this side. This is coil negative right here. Uh, this up a little bit. <coughs> this is coil negative on this side. Now you can kind of see it. This is negative and this is positive. Okay? Coil negative is the side that's being controlled. Uh, it's no coincidence that the tachometer would be on coil negative. So let's let's map out the coil negative circuit first. And comes over to a tack terminal uh, order design. Your car probably has one too. You can monitor the tack. Uh, the RPM is based on coil primary. Uh, comes up this way, and you see these uh, extra wires in this picture. Um, looking at the at the circle around the wire, the little dotted line, those are shields on a wiring diagram. So just ignore that. That's a shielded circuit. That's what that means. Um, this tachometer, notice, goes right to the instrument cluster. So it's the instrument cluster RPM gauge is directly fed from coil negative is what we know so far. Um, there's a tie-in right here that we got to worry about. Where does this go? So we come up here, we follow this one. Uh, it's not going to work like that. Let me keep those together. Okay. Sorry, give me one second. Sorry about that. If you follow this, I'm not going to. So I'm following this blue wire where it goes. Making you guys dizzy. I'm sorry. So I'm not cooperating. Apologize. Let's just shrink this down for a second. Great. All right. Over here, I have this diagram kind of pieced together. Older, older diagram, but uh, in no designations. This is the ECU, what they call the ECU. That's the engine computer. So what is that wire right there? That is my RPM input <coughs> to this engine computer. RPM input coming from coil negative. Okay, it's the same input that uh, the instrument cluster is going to use. And what we know about this system <laughs> does the computer control the ignition timing on this car? No, it does not. So that wire right there that we just mapped out on this diagram has nothing to do with ignition control. Where's the picture go? There it is. So are we worried about that that circuit right there? Are we worried about that wire that goes to the engine computer that I just mapped out for you, which would be, again, this wire right here? In a no-spark situation, are you concerned with that circuit? <coughs> I'm not. That's an input. 
to the engine computer. Okay? What's the computer going to use that input for if it's not using it for ignition? This is a fuel injected car. Notice the injectors. These are pair fired injectors. So there's two drivers for the injectors. Computer needs to know when to fire the injectors. That's where it's what it's used for. That's its main purpose would be for injection control. Okay? So one of the things that would maybe be helpful so far in this no spark diagnosis on this car, see if you have injector pulse. That would give you some direction. Um, but that's not going to be foolproof, though, either, because they both kind of rely on coil negative, and if you don't have coil negative control, you're not going to have injection pulse, because that's the input for this. All right, so coil negative, where is the other part? Where is the control? It's right here. So back to this picture, and it's this side right here, and it says NCA. What do you think NCA means on this wiring diagram? NCA. No color available is what NCA means. Older designs, this is not uncommon to have an NCA. Uh, you know, and generally when you get an NCA, it's when you have a sub harness that is different on different models. Uh, and that, that's kind of a sub harness connector that can change color. Um, uh, generally, sensor side colors you're not given. They'll give NCA on sensor side colors on some components. But <clears throat> where is the igniter? That was my question when I first looked at this picture. Where's the igniter at? See this right here? It says igniter. Look, they spelled it with an ER on this diagram. So you guys that think I'm crazy and sometimes I spell it with an OR and sometimes I spell it with an ER, it's not my fault. You guys with me? Look, it's spelled with an ER in this picture, and then the description and operation, they spell it with an OR. Whatever. Igniter. Look at the picture, though. Igniter, where is it? Where's the igniter? It's inside this damn distributor. All right, so back to our four-pin GM design that we talked about. That's one of the wires. If we could picture this igniter, let's kind of visualize this thing for a second. What's the main component inside of this igniter? It is a transistor, right? And this transistor is going to switch to ground. This igniter is going to be grounded on the housing, right? And this wire right here is the one that's going to go to coil negative. This is coil positive. This is coil negative. Coil negative goes to the igniter. This is my NCA wire that I have drawn out right here. Is this wire right here. Does that make sense? So that's the wire that's going to control coil negative on this car. How's it doing that? What else does this igniter need? Yeah, I need a signal on the base, so I need some kind of small little square wave coming into this thing. Where does that come from? Because they're, they're not showing it to you in this, are they? Where does it come from? Our description and operation said what? What's inside this distributor? Right here. What's inside this distributor? A pickup coil. Right? And this is talking about armature teeth past pegs of the pickup coil. A signal is sent to the igniter. Look, OR. For us non spelling people, that just messes us up bad. All right, here's what we know what's inside the distributor is a pickup coil that's going to go into this igniter. Igniter's going to have some type of analog digital conversion, and it's going to switch this transistor on and off with that generated square wave from that pickup coil signal. <coughs> you guys with me? <coughs> All right. This thing needs something else. We need our power feed to turn this igniter on. 
Where's that come from in this picture? It's right here. The other NCA wire, where's that going to? It's going to coil positive. Well, what does coil positive have on it all the time? Battery voltage. Where's that come from? Look at the diagram. It comes from the ignition switch. Can you see that? So not only does the ignition switch power up coil positive, what does it also power up? It powers up my igniter so it can do its job. So how do you attack this thing for a no-star? First of all, before we answer that, does the kind of description operation make sense? Understanding this down here, that was pretty, uh, that was the reason I did the overview with you guys on the four pin. To attack this car for a no-spark, how do you do it? And this car's had two different distributors, two different ignition coils. Um, I read the description from the guy, and he had mentioned that it started with a battery replacement. The car kind of didn't start quite right in colder temperatures. He had a battery put in it. He had an alternator put in it. Had a starter put in it at some point in time. I mean, and now he's at a no start, no spark. And it, it kind of is a situation where the car will run for, uh, I think he said 30 seconds or so, and then the car stalls, and then he has no spark. And both distributors have done this. Both coils have done it. No, this is a, yeah. This is a uh, 626, Mazda 626. I mean, how do you attack this? What do you do? What do you guys think? I'm thinking if it was me and I could get this car to be a no-start, that would be key, first of all. Uh, doing any monitoring with the car running is going to be not very helpful. Although, I'll tell you, I'm concerned about voltage levels to this coil. Do you know what I mean? Uh, low voltage. Uh, it just seemed to be battery alternator oriented. To me, seems like a wiring voltage problem, either a bad ground somewhere or a low power feed. Uh, but, um, I, you know, let's... I know what I would do is I'd put a scope on it and I'd look at coil primary. Uh, and I have this in my book, guys, and we'll go to this later. When you look at a primary circuit, I'm going to do this real quick. Um, all right. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I was when I just paused that, but um, I'm pretty sure what I was going to say was what I would do to check this no spark situation is I would put a scope on coil negative and I would look at coil negative voltage. And what you look at when you look at a coil negative waveform, and I have this in my book, this is uh, section 22, um, uh, coil primary, uh, what you're looking for is uh, certain characteristics. Um, actually, I'll just draw it for you for now instead of going over that waveform just to keep it simple. Because I know this guy doesn't have a scope, and we don't have scopes either. You guys don't, at least not yet. Um, so a scope might not be uh, what you have. It's preferred. But what I'm looking for, some characteristics. If I'm looking at coil negative with a scope that's connected to ground, and it would be up here, it would just be tapped in off of this side up here with my scope, is I would be looking for, first of all, cranking what you'd want to see uh, on a zoomed out view, so maybe on like a, a zero to uh, one second time base, I would want to see, and I would set my scales on zero to probably 50 volt, because you're going to get spikes, remember the spikes, and actually those spikes will go up to 400 volts, so you could actually set your scale higher. But what I'd want to see during cranking is I'd want to see basically a flat line with these with these big spikes in the screen. And and what those would be, and actually these would be buried off of a 50 volt screen. They'd be actually going higher than 50. But what this would tell me for a no spark situation is that there is coil negative control, what I call control testing. We're looking for control. Um, to show you a picture of that real quick too, I have that. Um, in in section uh, 22, um, and this one's a uh, just a basic one. It's this one right here. And, and so what I'm showing for a no spark in this situation, this is two different cars. 
uh, two different no spark situations. Uh, this is page nine, section 22. We'll get there later, but just to get an idea, um, I'm actually on a five second screen. I'm using the Snap on Vanity, old school graphing multimeter, so don't have good detail. But what is all this stuff in here? What is going on in there? Yeah, it's coil negative control. Coil negatives being turned on and turned off. And the big spikes on the screen are indicating a uh, collapse of a magnetic field. So this car had no spark and had this waveform. What would you do? What would you put it? Would you put an igniter in the car or would you put a coil in the car for the left picture? You guys say igniter. I say coil. Here's why. The igniter is functional in this left picture. That's what this is telling you. What does the igniter do? It turns on the base of a transistor. Sorry, what well, it does, but the transistor is turning on, pulls coil negative to ground. We need to back up here for a second. I think we need a little bit more info on what we're talking about with the coil. So let's eliminate this for a second. And what happens when a transistor uh, completes its path is a transistor is an electronic switch, we said, right? So what's this, what's this look like if the switch is closed as opposed to open? Open switch, start up here. Picture this as an open switch. What is the voltage going to be on coil negative right here? What are you going to read? Very good. Even though it's the negative side of the coil, we're still going to read battery voltage. And it should be system voltage. If the car is cranking, you know, voltage is going to be a little lower. So anywhere from 10 to 12 volts during a crank, you'd want that line to be right there. What does that tell you about the feed side of the coil? It's good. So I don't have to jump over to the feed side to check it if coil negative reads 10 to 12 volts during a crank. What should happen when the transistor up here closes, switch closes to ground? What should happen to the voltage now? Voltage should drop to near, near ground voltage. So a few hundred millivolts is okay, right? A couple hundred millivolts above ground is okay, but that should be very near ground, which would be zero volts. What if that line right here only drop down to say six volts. What's our problem? We have a bad ground. So you see why the scope is key here? Like you could actually see, because we said, where is this igniter's ground at? Where is the ground? It's in the distributor. There is no ground wire to check on this vehicle. So how do you check ground integrity on this car? Would be a scope looking at this waveform. That's how you check it. What's the ground look like? Right? See if it's there. So it should, it should pull near ground, and then what happens is there would be a limiting feature built in. So a typical primary current ramp, you're going to have a little increase in ground. This would be what I would call an intentional bad ground. What is the module doing or, or igniter doing during that section? It has achieved peak saturation in the coil, and what's it doing now? It's limiting current to keep the windings from burning up, and it's waiting. The coil's ready to go for when the piston gets in the right position, right? As soon as that piston is in the right position, now we let it go, and what do we get? A big, giant spike upwards of 400 volts is the next thing that happens. What, what happened right there is the transistor opened back up again, collapsed to the field. And then you'll get some other stuff in here, and this is like secondary feedback. We won't worry about that side. But do you see what you can see in a primary waveform? You can see good feed. You can see a good ground. If you zoom out on that, let's go back to this now. If you zoom out on that picture, What am I looking at in this left picture? I'm looking at a lot of these all crammed together in a very long time base. Does that make sense? They're all packed together. So when I say I'm not looking at detail, 
I'm just looking for these spikes. What do the spikes tell me about the transistor operation inside of that igniter or module? It's good. It's functioning. And if the car has no spark and you have a signal that looks like this to the left, you're going to put a coil in that car. Okay? Picture to the right. This is another coil negative, another car with no spark. What are you going to do? Don't put a coil in that car to the right. That's kind of where we're at. Coil on the left, don't put a coil on the right. It could be an igniter over here on the right-hand side, but it could also be an input problem to the igniter, couldn't it? Couldn't it also be a power or ground problem on the igniter if that was the system it had? So we got to do some further investigation here, but the, the answer with this is no spark on this one. Put a coil in it. No spark on this one. Don't put a coil in it. A coil's not going to function and get spark unless it's being turned on and off. All right, so you don't have a scope. Now what do you do? How do you handle doing this test looking for control when you don't have a scope? Because a lot of people don't. Fortunately for this guy, I already have this video up on YouTube, and it's called Control Testing with a Tesla. And what I've done is I've taken, I need to do this with you guys still, but I've taken a page um, out of my book, let me find it, and uh, Control Testing with a Tesla. I took this page and I did like a 45 minute overview on how do you handle a, you know, engine cranking, control testing with a test light. And just to plug the info in here, what I did in a different video, and this was page eight. Let's go back to this one and, and talk about, uh, talk about what we'd see using a test light and not a scope. And what would this look like? If I didn't have a scope, I'm on coil negative. So where, where is that up on this picture? Coil negative again, that's up here. What would I do? I'd put a test light here, to ground, and I'd put a test light here to ground. And I would crank the engine over, and I'd look at both sides, okay? The reason I look at both sides, I'll tell you in a second. Let's go, uh, let's talk about the positive side. What's that going to look like? If I put the test light to ground and I crank the engine over, what's the test light going to look like? Could, it might actually flutter a little bit. What would cause the fluttering while I'm cranking an engine over on coil positive? Very good. The starter amperage changes. When you crank an engine, you see a very large spike in amperage, and then it comes down, and you get these amperage oscillations in a system. They can be 50 to 80 amps of oscillations. What do you think battery voltage does in re reaction to that? If you ever superimpose battery voltage with starter current, it's the exact opposite. And you'll see what I just drew in red would be battery voltage. So if battery voltage is fluctuating up and down, what do you think the test light might look like? It might kind of flutter or flicker a little bit. Um, I would suggest to you guys and to this guy to at this point watch my Subaru no spark, no start diagnosis where I'm using a test light to do this very thing. So I'll show you guys that in a minute. That video is up there too. Definitely want to watch that one. But in any case, the test light should be steady. Would you agree with me by that, that we should have a, a nice bright light cranking on coil positive? Now, this isn't the greatest test in the world, but would that address on our diagram some kind of ignition switch problem? Because remember, ignition switch feeds coil positive, and it would. I mean, a bright light, I'd rather a voltmeter here. If we were worried about the ignition switch and a low voltage, you know, 8 volts to a test light can still be a pretty bright bulb. You know, 8 volts, if battery voltage is 12 and I only have 8 going to my coil, imagine what it is during crank when system voltage drops to 10, and now I'm down to six volts on the coil, and that car is not gonna start with six volts on coil positive. Voltmeter might be key there, right? All right, so come over coil negative, when we wanna see test light connects to ground again, 
What's this going to look like? This is going to be bright just like this one is as long as the transistor is open. And there won't be a difference between the brightness of these two bulbs because this coil primary winding only has like one ohm of resistance, one to two ohms. So you're not going to have a large voltage drop with your test light across there. That test light only draws 200 milliamps. It's going to be bright is the point. You won't see a difference. What we want to see a difference of when we crank the engine over, I want to see this test light flicker on and off. Does that make sense? If this test light's flickering on and off, and it's very subtle, but what's that tell you about the trigger mechanism, the igniter? Is the igniter working? And that's the point. That's what we would do in this situation. Test light to battery positive. Sorry. Test light to battery negative for both tests. Take the test light, go to coil positive and coil negative, and compare the two. They should look different from each other. How do you, how do you address the fluttering of coil positive to, let's call it, the flickering of coil negative caused by the transistor opening and closing? You do them both cranking. That's why we do them both cranking. So we address the starter humps and current changes. And what do we want to see on the two? They should look different from each other. Does that make sense? So that would be with a, with a, uh, with a test light. And honestly, in, in this guy's situation, probably not ideal being that We've already had a coil replaced twice. We've already had an igniter replaced twice. This is where a voltmeter is going to be key. And honestly, a scope would be ideal looking at this waveform. Something's going on with the wiring on this thing. You know, that it's able to run for 30 seconds or 30 minutes or whatever, whatever it was. But here's what we definitely know is that, you know, actually he told me one other test that I like I liked that he did it. One other test that he told me he did in the process of all of this is he eliminated the tack wire. He was worried about his instrument cluster. Could there be something sorted out on the coil negative, this yellow blue wire? Uh, something in this tachometer circuit or the one going up to the computer, is there something in there that could be sorted out? Sure, it is possible. And what the guy did, which I liked, he actually cut the yellow blue Tackley got it out of the picture and still had the same issue. So we can at least be comfortable in what, guys? Where is our problem? Our problem on this car is no further than that green circle. That's it. Right? Now go back to his battery alternator issues, long crank time. He, he's got a voltage feed problem, is my guess looking at this right low voltage to this system right or a bad ground now if he doesn't have a voltmeter he needs to go buy one because the checks that need to be done i think the test light aren't going to be good enough in this application obviously he doesn't need to go buy a scope but you see my red my, my red line going to the igniter right here not only does the coil need to have power right here isn't it also important that cranking that he takes a voltage reading to ground right here on this other igniter NCA no color available wire? That should be a steady feed too. That's my main power feed for this igniter. Um, as far as checking the igniter uh, ground, you really can't uh, unless you have a scope and I showed you that primary waveform where you could check the igniter ground. But wouldn't that be the distributor housing itself needs to have a good ground? Is it a potential that the, the distributor housing could have some kind of corrosion on the base, you know, where it attaches to the block, and we have some kind of a ground issue? Do you, do you know what I mean? Where, how would you catch that, though? It's a loaded circuit voltage test. You're not going to catch it on a voltmeter. Why? Because how fast is coil negative on this other NCA wire being pulled to ground? You're talking milliseconds, right? I mean, you look at a primary waveform. Let's go back and look at one just to get an idea. You look at this primary waveform I have right here. 
And how long is this thing being held to ground? Well, I'm set on a, this is a uh, millisecond time base. This is a 10 millisecond time base. And so we got from right here to right here, you're talking five milliseconds that that coil is being turned on and off to ground. Five milliseconds. Do you think your voltmeter is going to show you those drops? Do you think you're going to catch the full ground on a voltmeter? You're not. So what the hell do you do about the distributor for a, for a ground? I don't know. Maybe you could run some jumper wires to the distributor. Do you know what I mean? Think outside the box a little bit. You don't have a scope that's going to show you the waveform, so maybe you could uh, you could put some uh, put a pair of jumper cables on the distributor housing. You know what I mean? Jump it right to the block or right to battery negative. And would that address the ground issue of the distributor? Something to think about. <laughs> um, can you think of anything else we can give this guy to have him check? So rehash, what do we want to do? We want to check the igniter feed. That's this wire right here. This NCA that I haven't read, we'll call this um, igniter feed. Needs to be verified. Would you agree? Right? Um, if we're going to use a test light and do coil positive, coil negative, that'd be fine. Test light on coil negative to ground. Test light on coil positive to ground. They should look different. Let's say they look the same. They're both steady. We're not done with the test light. Take your test light over here on this other wire and go to ground again. Sorry about my test light here. So what you're doing here is the same thing that you would be doing here, right? And what if it's lit constantly here, but you come over here and it's not lit at all? What would that tell you? What would be your problem? If your test light was lit right here, but you come over here and it's not lit, it's out. What do you got? You have an open in that wire. In that wire that goes to the distributor, you have an open in that wire. So that would be something else he needs to check. And that's it, right? And the result of that would, would definitely help us. Oh, honestly, the feed coming in from this ignition switch would be important to verify, not only at the igniter, which I'm saying igniter feed, but the coil feed too, and getting a good feed on that. Somewhere within that, this guy should be able to give us some kind of answer. Hopefully, he'll, he'll get back to us and let us know what he finds.